Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're happy that you're here. And I commend all of you. You're awake. You're shivering. But what a wonderful day that brings us together. This is the day of all days, and especially in our faith and in the practice and witness of our faith. Christ the Lord is risen today. <coughs> Hallelujah. That is worth praising, that is worth celebrating. At the same time, I'm hoping this music won't fly. But it's fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, different, ch different challenges. <laughs> but, but nothing like what Christ did, right? Uh, if I missed a word, just continue singing on, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, 
is risen. Amen. We want to thank our Chancellor Choir for this timely and inspiring Easter anthem of praise for what resonates in each of our hearts throughout our lives. I would like to thank the Virginia for his very effective and gracious assistance as our liturgy. Thank you, Jim, especially for that one prayer. We thank our acolytes and our ushers and our greeters. Dear friends, we thank each and all of you. You could have been other places this day at this cycle. And you chose to be here. And our worship and our fellowship are made more complete by the fact that you're here engaged in worship with us. This is Easter Sunday and has been my practice now for more than 25 years. On Easter Sunday and on the Sunday before Christmas Day, my sermon is a monologue depicting and portraying one of the biblical characters associated with whatever that message might be. And this morning, in our worship and proclamation, my monologue will feature and portray the father of the repentant thief. One of the two thieves crucified with Christ from the Lord of that Friday morning. That thief which has this picture tradition is the right of Christ, the one who acknowledged his sin and asked the Lord to remember him. The reading of scripture is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. As you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Let us now hear the word of God. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding Jesus and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other thief rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's stop together to pray. Our Father and our God, in these moments of our worship and proclamation, grant now that the words of my mouth and the collective meditation of all of our hearts will be pleasing and honor to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. I will never, ever forget that dark and difficult day as long as I live. No father ever could. Even after all these years, I still can't erase all those terrible memories. It's like a continuing nightmare from which there is no escape. I remember it was the day before the, before the Feast of Passover. And as you might well guess, Jerusalem was swarming with thousands and thousands of people. Not only from Judea and Galilee, but from throughout the Roman world. Thousands of Passover pilgrims would come to Jerusalem to celebrate, to engage in the festivities to pay their annual obligation to the temple. As I well remember, I did not sleep well that night before. You would call it Monday Thursday. That Thursday night found me trying to sleep. And yet as I closed my eyes, my mind kept saying, this cannot be. This must not be happening. And like you would well imagine all through that restless night, I tossed and turned, but frequently I found myself crying and weeping. My heart was aching like never before. But finally, that Friday morning, daylight came. And the daylight forced me to face the dread reality of what I had been thinking about for several days. Hurriedly, I got up. I dressed. I left home without breakfast. To tell you the truth, there was no way I could eat that morning. I was not hungry, but I was fearful and afraid. Early that morning, I walked quickly into Jerusalem, there to the Roman fortress, to the praetorium. It was there that the authorities were holding my son 
and other prisoners who would that day be crucified on a Roman cross. It was my son's last day. Though I had known about this day for several months, the fact that he was there then caused me to tremble as I made my way toward a meeting with my son, hopefully. My mind kept going back, racing back to my son's childhood. He seemed to enjoy life as a boy. He meant everything to me and his mother. As he grew, he enjoyed being with me. Often he would go with me to my work. There he would entertain himself and we would talk at lunch. I was so proud of him. My pride as a parent was focused in that child. And oh, how much he wanted to please me. But then as he grew older, especially in his mid to late teenage years, he became more and more a loner. There was little family involvement. Somehow he got to the wrong crowd. And as such, he did things he should not have done. More than once he got in trouble with the authorities, and I would go and intervene and try to help him. But instead of being helped, he became more and more involved in the various crimes. I even went and spoke to our rabbi. My rabbi shared with me counsel from the scriptures, and I in turn talked to my son as best I could, trying to help him see the error of his way. But it seemed, dear friends, the more I talked with him, the more I tried to counsel him, the more divine, the more rebellious he became. It was almost like there was a demon taking hold of the spirit controlling him, directing him. And at times he would say, Daddy, I'm sorry. Give me another chance. He would make promises to do better. But all of those promises were in vain. Indeed, he became more and more involved in the criminal behavior around Jerusalem. Finally, I was there and I went up to speak to one of the soldiers on the platform. I identified myself as the father of one of the three to be crucified that day. And I was hoping for compassion that he would allow me to go back and see my son there in his cell. But there was no compassion. He told me to leave the platform to go out and join the others in that growing crowd. And how my heart ached. My hope to spend time with him, to hug him, to let him know that I was there for him with him were all to no avail. How I wanted, just for a few moments, to put my arms around him, to whisper in his ear that your daddy loves you, son, no matter what you've done, no matter what this occasion is, be assured that your daddy is here and that you're loved. But those Roman guards would not relent. Even though I kept begging and pleading for just a few moments before he was brought out to face the crowds, Finally, my son and the other prisoners were brought out. I recognized one of the other prisoners. He was my son's partner in crime. And many a time I had thought that it was this man who led my son into such criminal behavior. I learned from some people standing next to me that the other prisoner was a prophet, a peasant preacher from Nazareth, a Nazarene, a man called Jesus of Nazareth. I noticed standing within the crowd, the Roman governor took charge and he began to speak to the crowds gathered, numbering hundreds, even thousands. It seemed to me, from my perspective, that the governor was paying special attention and concern to the prisoner called Jesus. He seemed to want to mediate a compromise to somehow keep from crucifying this man called Jesus. He said to the crowds, I have interviewed this man, I've interrogated him, and I find no crime worthy of death that this man has done. And then Pilate said, I will scourge him. I will flog him. I will punish him. And then I will release him. But immediately the crowd responded, angrily, no! You must crucify this man called Jesus. And Pilate was shocked. And as an effort to keep from crucifying this man called Jesus, he said, it is my custom each Passover to release a criminal, even the worst and most notorious criminal in all of Judea. 
And of course, most of us who lived in Judea knew that he was speaking about Barabbas. Barabbas was an insurrectionist, a murderer. And here is Pilate saying, if you will let me release Jesus, then I'll crucify Barabbas. But the people said no. Release Barabbas, the worst criminal in all of Israel, and crucify Jesus. And when Pilate again tried to negotiate this, they said to him, if you don't crucify Jesus, you're no friend to the sea, sir. And so it was. Pilate felt the pressure of the crowd. And he said to them, his blood will be upon you and not me. Then he called for a basin of water. And one of the attendants brought a bright, shiny basin filled with water. And ceremonially, the governor washed his hands before the crowd. And then he said again, His blood, the blood of Jesus, is upon you. <clears throat> so it was that the Roman guards came up. They took charge of these three prisoners to be condemned to death that very day. I can still hear the centurion's command as he ordered this column of soldiers and these three prisoners to begin their track from the praetorium all the way through the city gates of Jerusalem, beyond the city gates up to a hill called Golgotha. It was there on Golgotha, outside the city walls, that crucifixions were performed. When you would enter or leave Jerusalem, you would see the vertical bar standing there on that little side. They were left there to remind to all of us that we, the Jewish people, were an oppressed people, a subject people, and that the penalty for our misdeeds, our crimes against the empire, was certain crucifixion. And that day, as public humiliation for those condemned to death by crucifixion, the criminal had to bear his own cross beam. As I said, the vertical bar was left in the ground. But the cross beam was to be taken by each of these men condemned to death. And I can remember seeing my son with his cross beam, his partner in crime, but I especially took note of this Jesus when he turned around and his back faced me. I saw how splendid his back and his body were. When the officials had scourged this Jesus, they had used those leather whips with several strands Embedded in each leather strand were pieces of bone and metal and glass. The Roman affliction for such a crime was 39 lashes administered by the Roman guards. And the back of this man called Jesus was so spread that you could see actual bones through the flesh. When Jesus began to mount that cross beam across his back and shoulders, he was so weak. He had been so severely abused, he couldn't sustain the weight. More than once he stumbled and fell, and there was a hush all across the crowd when they saw just how weak and how badly beaten he was. After two or three times of Jesus trying to bear the weight of that cross beam, the centurion stopped the march. Now the march from the praetorium to Donovan was 1,000 yards. A little more than half a mile. And so stop there in that narrow street in your day is called the Via Dolorosa, the way of Sodom. Immediately the centurion spotted a man in the crowd, a black man, a man that I would learn whose name is Simon. He had come from Cyrene in North Africa for the Passover. He was caught up in all this, and it was to him the centurion said, Man, come forward. I want you to bear the weight of this cross beam for this man about to die. And of course, the man from Cyrene bore that cross, and he assisted Jesus as best he could. And finally, after several minutes, the procession had reached all of them. And there, everything that I had feared began to unfold. For so many weeks, even months, what was happening was more conceptual, more theoretical. But now it is concretely happening. In your day, you would say it was surreal. I was so captivated by what was happening 
I knew it was happening, but I wanted to reject it, to deny it, but there was no way. I remember vividly seeing my son and the other thief and Jesus being laid against the ground. They took the cross and placed it under their back, under their shoulders. And while these men were lying on the ground with their arms outstretched on that cross beam, one of the soldiers took a large iron spike and drove it through the hand into the wood. Then after the nails had pierced their hands and their palms, holding them to the cross beam, soldiers came to each one, assisting them to stand, escorting them to the vertical beam. And there they attached a rope on a pulley on the top of that vertical beam. And they put it around that cross beam and they began to hoist up that person on the cross beam. I'll never forget the sound of that noise when suddenly the cross beam fell into the slot on the vertical beam. It was a thud that even now I can hear. Then routinely they took the feet and legs of each of those to be crucified. Brought the feet together with another iron spike. They pierced that flesh, attaching those feet to the vertical beam. It was after my son had been raised up on that cross that finally one of the soldiers had compassion. And he came to me and he said, Now you can go and be near your son. Heard that I went to the cross upon which my son was dying. I put my arms around his legs, his feet. I looked up at him and I said, Son, I love you. I will always love you. Son, I want you to know that I'm here. And son, I want to tell you that I'm sorry for how I failed you as a father. And I said to my boy, how I wish that we could go back to your childhood and do all of this again. Later that morning, I heard my son's partner in crime mocking the prisoner called Jesus. Now before that, from the crowd and from religious leaders, there had been one mock, one ridicule after another, level at Jesus. But now my son's partner in crime was saying openly, Are you not the Christ? If so, save yourself and us. A few moments later, I saw my son raise up on that cross to, to grab air. And I heard my son say to his comrade, Don't you fear God? Don't you fear God since you're in the same sentence of death? And we indeed justly deserve death. For it is the due reward of our sins, our crimes. But this man, this man called Jesus, has done nothing wrong. A few minutes later, as I looked up toward my son's face, I heard him say to Jesus in the most prayerful, the most sincere tone, I think I've ever heard him speak. Looking to Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What was he saying? What kingdom? What's he talking about? The wine they had given him must have made him delirious. And then as I was listening for Jesus to speak to him, the soldier pulled me back and said, get back into the crowd. And so whatever this Jesus said to my son, I was unable to hear. Later that afternoon, there on Godfrey, the prisoner named Jesus died. He died at 3 o'clock. And I tell you, friends, that from 12 noon until 3 in the afternoon, there was absolute darkness like there was no sun. And I felt, and everyone else felt, during that same three hours, the earth trembling, shaking. It was about 5 o'clock that my son and his comrade died. When they came by and found that Jesus had died, one soldier stuck a spear in his side and Water and blood gushed out. But because my son and his friend in crime were still alive, the soldiers broke their legs. And 
so between five and six o'clock that afternoon, the soldiers pronounced the other prisoners dead. My heart was so broken, I could not imagine how I could face the days that lay ahead. But dear friends, as dark and as difficult, as dreary as that particular Friday was, they can hasten to tell you that what happened that day is not the whole story. There's much more. And I'm so pleased and glad to share with you this part of my story. It was several months later, maybe four or five months later after my son's death, that a man came to my door in my little village. I heard a knock. I opened the door. And there stood this man that I didn't know. He introduced himself. He said, my name is John, and I'd like to talk with you. He said, I was there on that Friday when your son was crucified. And I said, come in, come in. He said to me, I was there with the prisoner called Jesus. He was my master, my Lord. And I have been his disciple. And your heart, your, your, your face and your burden have been on my heart. And so I went to one of the government offices in Jerusalem and they told me your son's name and where you lived. And so I've come to, to talk with you and know how pleased I was that he had taken that effort. That he was there to share with me what I had no knowledge about. I tell you this morning, never has a visit or a conversation with anyone so turned my world upside down. Or more correctly, had turned my world so right side up. He told me that there on that Friday afternoon, when my son said to Jesus, Lord, remember me. When you come to your kingdom, he said, what you didn't hear is this, and I'm here to tell you. Jesus said to your son, today, truly I say to you, today, you'll be with me in paradise. And I wanted you to know as his dad what Jesus said. And what all of that means, especially to your son, and perhaps even now to you. And then he said to me, this Jesus that you watched die, and was buried in a borrowed tomb on Sunday morning, just three days later, came back to life. He was raised from the dead. And I could not believe my ears. You mean this man who was put to death is alive with him? He said, yes. We have talked with him. We've touched him. We've fellowshiped with him. And it's because of him that I'm here this morning to share with you something as to what your son is already and I said, please, please tell me more. John said to me, your son believed in Jesus. On his deathbed, he said simply but earnestly, Lord, remember me. Not a very sophisticated prayer, but a prayer that emanated from the depths of his heart. And that man said to me, your son is with Jesus. Because Jesus came to life, was resurrected, because he lives, so is your son alive. Indeed, he is with the Master in heaven <coughs> this very moment. Oh, that day. That day, my son was a robber. <coughs> but in Christ's love, he was forgiven. He was saved. And because of what Christ did for him and for all people, my son is now in the kingdom of God. Beloved, I could hardly take it in. Amazing, my eyes filled with tears, a heart collected in my throat. Oh God, I praise you, I said. And then I asked God to tell me more about this Jesus. And he explained to me much of his life and his work, and that one day he's come to me. My friend John told me that I was see my son again. And that in heaven, if I embraced Jesus, we would be we would be my name. But it was then that John asked me the most important questions any person's ever asked. John asked me, Sir, would you like to accept Jesus? Would you like to embrace the Son of God as your Savior and as your Lord? Readily I answered, yes, yes, yes. Then John led me through a little prayer. And he 
in which I acknowledge my sins, my failures, in which I ask Jesus to come into my heart and live to be my master, to enable me to live in such a way that others would be drawn to him to Christ. This Easter Sunday morning gathered here with you, we celebrate the greatest of all miracles ever wrought on earth or beyond the earth. Jesus Christ is risen. He is raised from the dead. And dear brother and sister in Christ, in his resurrection, we too are raised. Not just in eternity, but even here now, we're being raised to a newness of life. Every day to be a new day. And not only are we running a previous day. Jesus now lives in my heart. He was raised from that guard too. He is raised and reigning in my heart. Dear friend, if you don't know the Master, He can live in your heart. Historically, the scriptures and even history says that Jesus was raised from the dead. But it matters little to your soul that Jesus is raised historically if simultaneously He's not also raised in is Christ raised in your heart, in your life, in your day to day? Oh, what a miracle we celebrate this Easter Sunday. The benefits of Easter are constant and consistent. We enjoy a quality of life which is abundant and full and everlasting. Dear Easter friend, it's my great joy to be with you this morning. And for us to hold in common, to celebrate as the body of Christ, the greatest miracle God the Father has ever done. And it continues to impact our lives and our daily living from this day forward. To God, to God be the glory. Great things He has done, is doing, and has yet to do in your life, in my life, in the life of this church. And in the corporate life of our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or shall we stand?
Christ and give them eternal abundant life that never, ever end. Praise God. The Lord bless you, dear each of the people. As you leave the Father's house, returning to your homes, as later today or tomorrow you'll embrace responsibilities and duties in your work, in your home and family, in your community. As we leave the Father's house, returning to our world in which we live and work, we leave on a mission, a mission continuous until the Lord comes, or until we take that final step in our pilgrimage to heaven. The Lord enable us this new week to make a positive difference with our character, our conduct, our conversation, to be sources of life, to be salt, to be avenues of help and hope and healing. God equip us with his inviting spirit to be as Christ and helping people find the way to Christ and through him to eternal life. Let's bow together for our benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and all of us this day and every day. Amen.